We have uh, another exciting panel. It's going to be on equities, uh, value equities. So we have uh, Chad Naylor, CEO of Naylor and Company, who is directly responsible for making all investment decisions. And he was previously corporate attorney and now a very, very successful manager. Uh, we have a Peter Lelek, Senior Relationship Manager and Director with Alliance Global Investors. He's responsible for developing the firm's institutional client relationship in the Northeast and is a member of the institutional business development team. We have Kenny Polkari, 30 years of experience, an engaging public speaker, and you can find him at, you can watch him on CNBC quite regularly. Speaks on industry and investor conferences all the time. Um, we have uh, Daniel Sheridan of Hinoki Capital Management, excellent manager. He spent 16 years prior to Hinoki, which is uh, his fund at Castle Lark Asset Management, where he held various roles, including risk manager, and was a member of the three-person portfolio management team. On this note, Peter, you have a microphone. Great, thank you. Uh, we're going to keep this freight train rolling here this afternoon, so uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, for everyone out there listening, we're we're excited to share some stories with you. So I think what we'll do first is we'll just introduce ourselves in a little more detail, uh, just so you hear the backgrounds of, of the professionals on the stage. Very briefly, I'm Pete Lelick from Allianz Global Investors. Uh, we manage $569 billion uh, across different asset classes, alternatives, equities, multi-asset, uh, as well as fixed income. Um, so, that's, so that's just a brief about me. And then we'll kind of go down the row here and, and uh, and Dan, why don't you start? Good afternoon. Dan Sheridan, Hinoki Capital. We run a long short equity fund. We've, it's, we've been in existence for five and a half years. We run with a 20 net, and what we're looking to achieve is to be a fund for all seasons. What that means is when the markets are down, we try to break even or make money. And when the markets are up, we try to keep up with 50% of what the market's doing on the upside. And we do that through stock selection. So far, over five and a half years, we've generated 60, 60 points of alpha with uh, half of that coming from the short side. So 11% annualized alpha with half of that from the short side. And our alpha generation has, has basically been the reason we put up nice returns on a low risk adjusted basis. That's great, hi. Yeah, Chad Naylor here from Naylor & Company. Uh, founded our firm 14 years ago. We're based in San Francisco. We do separately managed accounts, long only. Uh, we're deep value investors. Uh, try to get into industries when they're in recovery, find the strongest competitors. Uh, this has let us get uh, about a little over 15% a year uh, net of fees uh, while the market's been doing about 10 over our time period of that 14 years. Um, real happy to be here, talk about uh, value investing, deep value investing, and like Dan, to talk about ways to protect yourself in markets that get choppy. We do it in a different way through strong fundamental companies, but we'll get into the details of that. Yeah, go ahead, Kenny. Thank you. Uh, my name's Kenny Polkari, and I'm an institutional equity broker, member of the New York Stock Exchange, and I have been for the last 35 years. I went there in 1983 and really fell in love with it, never left. I represent um, these gentlemen in the marketplace when they're looking to access, liquidate, or initiate positions in listed as well as NASDAQ equities. I, I, uh, my customer base would include institutions, certainly in this country, hedge funds, mutual funds, pension plans, foundations, as well as those same institutions across Europe. Great. Well, um, Dan, I think I'm going to start with you. Um, it's been some tough sledding in the long short equity hedge fund space over the past few years. Um, long short, you've had great performance, but long short funds uh, in aggregate haven't kept up with market beta. So, you know, as we're kind of getting to some frothy valuations, we heard a couple of the other panelists uh, mentioned equities getting into thin air. Why do you think now makes sense, uh, if it does, uh, for long short equity and, and talk about some of the opportunities you're seeing on both the long and the short side. The, uh, the last panel talked a, light a, bit, a lot about a, a lack of dispersion and a lack of downside. And when you think about what a hedge fund's trying to do, they're trying to take advantage of volatility, they're trying to take advantage of down downside, they're trying to take advantage of markets that just don't go in one direction. When the, uh, when the Fed started their QE program after 08, you also had a market that was very macro dominated with a lack of dispersion. And those things in general have hurt the average hedge fund, which is, is trying to trade on both sides and benefiting from dispersion. 
And what we've noticed over the past year is that as the Fed is starting to move towards its normalization process, you're starting to see dispersion come back into the marketplace. Correlations were north, well north of 0.6 up in the 0 0.7, 0 0.8 range. They've now come down into the 0 0.3, 0 0.4 range and heading lower. And not surprisingly, equity long short has had its best alpha year in 2017 in the last six or seven. We believe that we're on the beginning of that trend starting to turn around. Um, fortuitously, we've performed regardless and, and we're, 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 we're a longer term investor. We make our trades over longer time frames and we're, we're less looking to pick off that short-term dispersion, but, but I think that's the reason that hedge funds have suffered. But again, we're, we're focused on looking forward rather than what just happened in the rear view mirror, and we think that that alpha and that, that stock selection and that dispersion should be coming back. So, uh, Kenny, maybe over to you kind of on the similar topic. Um, you've been at this for, for many, many years, and you've seen the market structure change dramatically from when you started on the floor in the early 80s you know, what are you seeing now in equities with rise of passive, high frequency trading? Um, you know, any thoughts uh, as to the, the current market structure and how that's relating to, to lack of dispersion and, and trading, um, you know, with the proliferation of, of multiple trading venues, you know, beyond the NYSE? Right. Okay. So thanks. So uh, understand one thing about market structure today versus market structure then, right? Uh, then the New York Stock Exchange was the central marketplace and everything that traded came there as a result of automation, as a result of decimalization, market modernization, as well as the events of 9-11. Market structure today is vastly different than it was and as a result then creates it's got its pros and cons. It certainly creates opportunities in some spheres, like the high frequency trading. It causes kind of confusion uh, amongst uh, traditional kind of asset managers because there's not a single pool anymore of liquidity, right? Because today there are 10 exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange being one. The other nine are virtual. They trade in the cloud. You can't touch them or see them. And then there are 50 or 60 alternative venues, which are just that. They're venues, not exchanges. You can still trade stock in them, but yet they are all automated. Uh, and so therefore, it's fragmented. And so in order to find liquidity, in order to assess kind of supply and demand, you have to be, A, connected to certainly the 10 exchanges, but you have to be connected to a range of alternative venues to kind of find out where the flow is. What we've lost in market structure today is the ability to have that direct conversation with the, with the brokers that were on the floor. Additionally, because of the automation, decimalization, and sub-decimalization, it's given rise to certainly the high-frequency crowd, which, is, uh, which are really a crowd of, a crowd of uh, traders that use nothing but super-powered computers to look for those minute arbitra arbitrage opportunities between the multiple venues by thousands of a penny, which creates all this chaos and noise. And I think that's the biggest thing. There's a lot of noise, and there's, and there's a sense, I think, from... Um, well, certainly from traditional investors, mom and pop retail, as well as institutions, concerned about the noise, concerned about the fragmentation and kind of the, the message that it gets. On top of that, that automation and that sub decimalization has given rise to passive investing, right? Which are the ETFs, which is now you get exposure to the drug industry by buying one stock or the financial industry by buying the XLF. You get exposure to everything. And so it's really changed the way that the markets trade. It's changed the way stocks trade. Um, most of it's now automated. So it gets... It, uh, 95% of it's automated. And so um, it gets, uh, you, you had to, you have to be able to adjust to be able to understand now where supply and demand is. And then you have to really, I think the most frustrating part for me is the fact that we've lost that gut feel because now this doesn't exist anymore. It's all in the cloud. And so you've got to kind of develop a new sense of, of how you manage markets, how you understand supply and demand, where you think the supply and demand is, and then how to interact with it. But I think ETFs, um, have absolutely changed the way markets function as well as individual investors. Maybe not so much for these guys because they're active investors and so they're looking for the individual names, but the ETFs can then create short-term short -term dislocations either on the buy side or the sell side depending on, depending on A, what's going on in the market and how those ETFs trade. And you saw that very clearly in the summer of August of 2015 when the, when the, uh, the Chinese yuan got devalued the market came under immediate pressure, was down 1,000 points in three minutes. In three minutes, we were down 1,000 points. And a lot of the stocks had trouble opening, which then affected the underlying price of the ETFs. And so therefore, it was a, it was a little bit of a, 
It was a little bit of a, it was a, bit of a chaotic situation. Uh, and it created chaos in the industry, certainly created chaas from those particular players in the industry, the ETF guys. You know, you try to manage that as best you could, but what you really understand is technology has changed the face of market structure forever. So maybe just picking up on that, Chad, you know, you've, you've run your fund through some of that rise of passive. These dislocations that Kenny was referencing, does it make it easier for you running money? Does it create more opportunities or does it just not matter? Have you always, have you been kind of running your process the same since inception and you don't need to adapt or, or do you say, you know what, this is presenting an opportunity for me as an active manager and, and I can capitalize on it? Yeah, I think that's right. I think it is, you know, we've been running it, you know, 14 years and, you know, we're always looking for long-term opportunities, uh, you know, in the space. I think what's happening, what we're seeing, we'll have a long-term theme uh, and we see that sometimes it takes longer to develop. Uh, a passive investment, pa passing investing strategies are out there flowing money into names by market cap so something that we think is overvalued can continue going on overvalued for longer than it would have in the past. And some name that's undervalued will continue going on undervalued for longer than the past. So what we're finding is we're going to do the same type of thing. We're going to find those undervalued companies. We're going to take our long-term approach. But we might have to be a little more patient with it as it, as it develops. So. We've done well. We've done quite well over the last five years or 14 years, whatever period you want to look at. But the last five years have been uh, very good for us. Uh, and, but what we find is, is that we'll have you know, one or two or three of our names you know, really taking off. Uh, the fundamentals will start coming in like we think they are. Um, that'll be great. Then they'll get pulled along even more by the market, uh, uh, sort of the passive strategies and their market weighting. Uh, and then the other ones that we feel are undervalued uh, might take a little bit longer to develop. We're getting kind of the same returns, uh, but it does take patience in, in the structure that you know, Kenny's talking about and what has developed. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what's working for us. Uh, yeah, also, also ahead, just, just as a follow-on to your hedge fund, equity long short funds have struggled. If you look 10, 15 years ago, after a company had a positive or negative earnings revision, the stock dynamic would play out over three days. If a stock was going to respond positively after an earnings revision, it would be up 3% the first day, 3% the second day, and 3% up the third day. Now with the alpha sucked forward, computers, ETFs, that stock's up, up 8% at the open on the first day. Right. Exactly. Almost, almost on the first trade. On the first right. trade. And, and when you think about some hedge funds, which, would, which they were the jackrabbit in the room versus the tortoise, they can out-computer a computer. Right? You're not faster than the computer, which is, is, is factor monitoring what's going on and trading all those things immediately. And I think what some funds are learning to do is they're learning to adjust because this is with us to stay. It's not going to change. It's going to become more so, not less. And basically what you have to do is say, I've got to step out of the realm where I'm competing with a computer. Right? From the last panel, they're talking about systematic strategies. If I try to out-systematic them, I'm going to get my head blown off. Right, so if I try to take the other side of the trade on a three-month basis, they're trading based on you know, short-term patterns. I'm trading based on longer-term patterns. That's where I can add value, but I've got to step out of that short-termism. Right, so what you're stepping out of is the noise because really what, what, what confuses the market today is all the noise that surrounds it. The noise is coming from the computers. The noise is coming from LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all these social media sites that are, everyone's got an opinion, everybody's got an idea, everybody's got a story, and the markets respond immediately because they can. So for instance, in the middle of the crisis, whatever year it was, 2010, you, you know, you'd have a perfect example of the, the ECB meeting in Brussels like they did every week, once a week. The markets might have been under pressure that particular day, but I'll, I'll, and I'll say the story because it's so realistic about what happened, but in the middle of the meeting, Angela Merkel gets up and leaves the room for no reason that anybody knew. But the Twitter message was, Angela Merkel leaves the room. The market immediately sells off because it's viewed as that's a negative. The poor woman went to the bathroom. Three minutes later, she comes back, and the message was, Angela Merkel enters the room. And the market goes from down 300 to up 100 within a minute and a half because it can, because the technology allows for that instant move. And that's the noise I'm talking about. That's kind of what's frustrating for 
for the retail investor, they see this, they see the market doing this, and they wonder what the heck is going on. But for guys like you, it's that noise that you have to kind of put away, just put it aside, don't pay any attention to it, and stick to their, stick to their, their goals. Another it, way to look at it is with, with ETFs, everything trades as a bucket. If you look back 15 years ago, the correlation, intra-industry correlation, meaning within retail as a for example, 0.5, that's now over 0.9. On any given day, when retail's up, the entire retail tape is up, right. including Sears, which right. everybody knows is a bankruptcy. Right. But Sears is part of an ETF that gets dragged along. Walmart comes out, for example, a week ago with a positive earnings surprise. Costco's up, Kohl's is up, e even though they may have just missed earnings a week prior. And what happens is, again, to the what hedge funds have struggled with, hedge funds are notoriously de-riskers and risk managers. And they're using those signals as, oh, something's wrong, I'm wrong here, the chart's breaking out, I gotta cover, when really what you have to do is say, wait three days, it'll pass, or wait five days and short the strength because this is fake, so to speak. So on that, um, Chad, are you finding the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater as a long only value investor? Are you seeing in some of these big basket sales, you know, it's like, okay, I, I really like that name and I'm gonna come in and buy it at this level. Um, or is it, is it not that short term for you? Uh, no, it's, it's in a sense become so because we'll track names that we like. Uh, so we'll see something we're like, okay, we like this. Um, we might like it even better if it were down 10%. We're going to get in an even better valuation point. So we'll get these moves and we're finding we're having to move faster because we had an example. I think we were tracking Whirlpool uh, and it came out with one earnings thing. One earnings thing took it down in one day, 10%. And we're like, Boom, it hit where we are. We don't know how long it's going to stay there. And we, you know, we had to get into the name that day. And within a few weeks, it was coming back up you know, as its fundamentals and everything else was, was playing out over time. But we have to be ready to move with, with the names that we watch, that we want to, that we want to own in the space. You, you also have to know what you're doing, because at that moment, the chart looks like hell. Right. It's broken. It's down on volume. And everybody who's a technician, and by the way, we follow a lot of technicals, says, oh my God, get out, something's broken here. If you don't know your names, if you don't know the price points, you're the one who's de-risking at the same time as everybody else. You have to pick your spots. Yeah, let's shift gears for just a minute. And uh, uh, the last panel referenced rising rates. Um, so you know, rates are, interest rates are going up here in the United States anyhow. Um, the equity markets have seemed to have this love affair uh, with the Fed and and that relationship has been great post-financial crisis. So Dan, maybe we'll start with you. How do you, you know, to, to your earlier point, you know, where's the puck going? How do you see that relationship unfolding going forward? That, you know, that, that tight bond that equity markets have had with the Fed and, and, and what do you see? We, we, we view it as um, basically the Fed is breaking up with you and um, you're, you're afraid to change your Facebook status, right? So right now the Fed has told you, we're going the other direction. We've been dating really nicely for eight years. We've loved each other, but we're, we're deciding we're breaking up with you. And you know, that guy is saying, no, 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 we're still dating, it's okay. And, and that can continue for a little while because rates up means deflation isn't a problem anymore and we've been fighting deflation for eight years. But we all know that interest rates and equity valuations are negatively correlated. And at some point, rates backing up will start to have an effect. And, and we don't need to postulate a crash or we don't need to postulate uh, a really vicious bear market. But really interesting couple set of facts, since the March 2009 bottom, the S&P is up 280% and the Nasdaq's up 420%. On an annualized basis, eight years, that's 17% per annum for the S&P and 21% per annum for the Nasdaq. And I think we've all seen that rolling chart that looks at 10 years of returns, and when you've been up 18% for eight years, there's usually a mean reversion on the other side of that because equity markets follow corporate profitability over time and interest rates. But you know what's very interesting? You know what the market's up as of this morning? The NASDAQ and the S&P? 21% and 17%. Right on, it's, it's right on trend. That, it's interesting that you said those numbers. Right. Because in my note this morning, when I write my morning note, I, you know, I put some of that data in. And those were the two numbers today in the, on the S&P and the NASDAQ. Right on trend. So when, when we think about the Fed breaking up with you, we step back and we say, okay, so I don't have that tailwind at my back anymore. And I know I'm over earning, so to speak, right now, that my ability at this valuation to deal with any problems is less than it was. 
And that just means there's going to probably be more dispersion. When stocks miss earnings, they probably go down as opposed to be, to be bid up. And again, we, we think that leads to a more normal market that might be akin to what we've lived historically versus, again, Mr. Niederhofer on the last panel talked about the least volatile year in 30 years. Again, that's why all the passive commentary is as strong as it is, right? You, people make those comments and have those violent feelings about how sustainable something is when typically it's at its least sustainable. And, and we think those things start to change. VIX 10, low vol, straight up, it starts to get a little bit more old, stu old school historical. So maybe just kind of staying on the, the Fed theme for a minute, but... But Chad, you know, in your space and value, you've seen a lot of investors come in, um, kind of crossover investors into quote, quote unquote bond proxies. Right. You know, how does that how does that impact what you're doing or have done over the last few years? But then again, looking forward to where the puck is going, what do you think happens as we get a little more of a decoupling here? Yeah, this is a big theme for us, and you know, we agree with Dan it is a time to be thinking of protecting yourself in the U.S. equity markets. Dan's doing it through you know, a significant shorting strategy in his. We're doing it in two ways. One is we're doing it, as we have always done, by having strong fundamental companies. Uh, so whether it was 2008, uh, we went down with the market, but we bounced back in about a year and nine months' time. By the end of 2010, we were almost fully recovered because our companies were fundamentally strong. That's one factor. Uh, the other factor is really just valuation-based. So here we are, uh, you know, the S&P 500, forward, you know, PEs, 18, 19, in that range. Maybe that's not uh, overvalue overvalued uh, with interest rates really low. Right? because they're competing against bond, bond yields. But as interest rates go up, and we really believe they're going up, we don't think we need much more inflation. We don't think we need much more economic growth. We just think the Fed needs to bring interest rates up to normalize so they have ammunition for the next recession. As that begins to happen, it's going to be hard on the bond markets in uh, 2000, 2001, after the big run-up. And that type of rotation, it can help Dan's firm with a, with a, number, of, a number of names coming down. It also can help us because that rotation led to people getting out of the higher price stocks and into uh, the value names or the value names with good solid growth. So that's what we believe is, is a distinct possibility. So we think you can protect yourself in a number of ways. Ours is one of them uh, that, that you can do in that, in that type of rising interest rate world. All right, last kind of on Fed. Kenny, <laughs> you've, seen, you've seen a couple of these cycles. You've seen Federal Reserves that have orchestrated it well, kind of uh, rising rates, uh, and then, and then some, not so, some not so good periods. What's your view on, on this Fed, um, how they're able to orchestrate an increase in interest rates, and what it means for equities? Okay, so I, I think here's the issue this time. This time it really is different because we're in a place where we've never been before in terms of the Fed's balance sheet, in terms of the decades-long stimulation that not only the Fed has put in place, but every other central bank around the world. And by the way, every other central bank around the world is continuing as of today to continue to stimulate. We at the moment are starting to withdraw, starting. Um, and so the fear is going to be is, is – how she manages it, how Janet Yellen manages it. Now, look, she might have three more months of a job or she might have two, you know, 24 more months of a job. And so that's going to be the next kind of question that comes into investors' minds because if the candidate that's out in front replaces her and it's Kevin Warsh and he's much more of a hawk, he's much more aggressive, he's been critical of the Fed all this time. And so it's interesting because the market shouldn't want him at the moment because if he is as aggressive as... He appears to be. I think then we get into much we get into much bigger problems. If he becomes more aggressive at raising rates, he's not going to necessarily care about the shake in the market. He may in fact want to shake out the market because he thinks the market is too far overvalued. That people have gotten too complacent with it. That's going to be the fear. If Janet Yellen remains as Fed chair, um, I think I think at least the market feels that they know what they got with her. They understand what she thinks. She can be a dove, but she's walking down the path of trying to manage this process as best she can. I think for the country and really for for interest rates, I'd rather see Yellen remain in this position, just because you know you know what you got with her. 
right? And we're already expecting another rate, rate hike in December. We're expecting three more in 2018. The market knows that. The market's trading on that information. Um, and so therefore, I think my, you know, my desire is that she stays. Is she the best? We can have that conversation too. But the fact is, she's there now. We know it. We got with her. And so therefore, the market and investors should probably want to, at this juncture in the road, stay with what they know, considering we've got the balance sheet where we've got and the tapering process is going to begin. And also, just back to the market structure question, uh, obviously, it's the anniversary of the 87 crash and not predicting that. But we're big believers that ETFs and quant trading are this generation's version of portfolio insurance. And they're going to lead to some sort of accident. Um, if you think about the flash crashes we've had, those transpired when nothing was wrong. Right. Those, those happened with nothing going wrong. A large cap dominant company like Apple, which was trading at seven times free cash flow, that traded from 109 to 91 that morning. Right. Uh, basically, 20% of its market cap evaporated in an hour because of a flash crash with nothing wrong in the economy, with nothing wrong at the Fed. And when you see those sorts of moves, you have to wonder what transpires if something goes wrong. Again, we're, we're not... We don't predict those things. We have a big long book that's offset by a big short book. We just, we're comfortable that we know if we wake up and there's a missile shot at North Korea or another flash crash, our shorts are gonna be protecting a long book which is gonna be getting hammered that day. And we just think we're moving into an environment where the next five years are farly, far unlikely to be as placid as the last five years were. Wait, to follow up on that comment, I think what's key in what you said, and listen, it happened, it happened with portfolio insurance in 1987. It happened in 2007 with all those, all those derivative products that were based on subprime mortgages that as long as the market was fine and there was nothing wrong and the market was going up, everyone thought they were a brain surgeon. Look what I created. I made all this money, blah, blah, blah. The minute it hits the fan and people don't know what's in them, the bottom falls out. When portfolio, 1987, what happened with portfolio insurance, prior to the market really coming under pressure, the global markets coming under pressure, portfolio insurance was great because it never did anything. But the minute it issued the sell order, everybody got the same sell order and the market collapsed. ETFs, to your point, or quant trading, to your point, as long as the market's kind of inching up and going like this, everyone's fine. But the minute something happens, whatever that is, whether it's a missile over North Korea, whether it's Janet Yellen. Are those rules that are in place now enough to sort sort out the mess if the mess happens well, well so here's the, here are the rules the, in 1987 there were no rules right there were no circuit breakers there were no stopgap measures as a result of 1987 it gave birth to broader stock market circuit breakers as well as individual stock circuit breakers so broadly speaking the market could drop seven percent before it's automatically halted everybody who trades understands that so if they halt the market at seven percent nobody's surprised the market will halt trading for an hour gives everybody a chance to sit back and take a breath and go whoa 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 what's going on here now after an hour, they open the market again. If it continues to come under pressure, it goes down another 7%. Then it gets halted for two hours. Gives people another chance to take a breath. The circuit breakers are not going to necessarily stop it. They'll slow it. But if the market wants to go lower, it's going to continue to go lower. After the second circuit breaker, if they open the market, comes under pressure again, they're going to let it go until the 4 o'clock bell rings. It could be down. At that point, we're already down 14%. Depending on what time in the day it is that that happens, the market could clearly tumble another 10, 12, 15% if that's what it's going to do, right? I would like to think, though, that the other side of the equation is, unlike in, when portfolio insurance existed in 1987, the risk management softwares that exist today are so much more diverse. I'd like to think there's so much more... Um, educated, right? They're smarter. And that at certain points, when Johnson & Johnson, which was trading at 94 on Friday night, October 16th, ended the day at 43 on Monday the 19th, it lost 50% of its value. It's Johnson & Johnson. They make baby powder. Are you kidding me? But it lost 50% of its value in six and a half hours. I'd like to think at a certain point, names like that, other risk management software says, whoa, 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 what's going on here? To your point, it's absolutely out of control, and that would initiate you know, real buyers to come in and say, this is way, way out of I, I, one, control. Right. One other point that I think is important, we're, we're talking about a crash scenario, right. and if, if I'm sitting in the, office, in the audience, I'm thinking, well, all right, what's the likelihood of that? 0.002%. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but I think what you have to think about is, what if it's not a crash, right. but the beginning of a more prolonged downturn? First, you know, so the Fed raises rates, economic growth slows down, and you hit that tipping point. And the market starts down 10%, right. and your mindset's not, 
all right, I'll just wait for a week because I know this is going to bounce back. But your mindset is, holy mackerel, the economy is slowing down, valuations are extended. Now what do I do? Well, a la it's, it's 2008. That emotion. 2008, it was a year and a half of down, up. Down, up, down. It was 62% by the time it got done, but it took a year and a half for it to happen. In 1987, in six and a half hours, you lost 22% in the broader market, and some stocks lost 50% in those six and a half hours. In a way, that was easier. It was, in a way, that was absolutely easier because the, it was over. It was over in six and a half hours. Right, and that's a similar thing that played out 2000 to 2002. We had three years of right. that going on, right. and I think that's when, that's when you're going you're gonna to see uh, what's happened with passive and active. You're going to see that either that crash scenario or that slow bleed is going to be like, those names are all going to come down and we don't think they're coming back real fast because they were overvalued to begin with. Right. And that's where we think, okay, on, on our side, not, not your short saying is, is different, but on our side, we think our names will, maybe they'll come down with the, some of the volatility, but they will, as they always have in the past, we believe that they'll bounce back faster. People start looking at fundamental valuations again, because, whoa, this passive thing didn't you know, really do it for me. Let's start looking at these fundamental valuations. If everything's come down 20% and we have something with a PE of 10 and there's now a PE of eight, it's like, whoa, there's some really inexpensive stuff out there. Let me get into that. And we begin an immediate rotation into that. Stuff. So maybe we stay on that, Chad, and, and you know, maybe we, we don't hit on actual names, but how does your portfolio look today? What are some of the sectors that you like? some of the sectors you're staying away from. Right. So for us, we believe that there's so much fear of another 2008-like crash that it's lead, led to an overvaluation of those slow-growing dividend-paying stocks, you know, the Johnson & Johnson, the baby powder. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm so afraid that that's what, that's what I want to own. Right. For it to drop 50% right. I, I, is right. Then it should go back up, but where it is now. So there's so much into that. And there's so much fear of a 2008 crash that anything that is tainted with anything that was hurt badly in 2008 is tainted to this day still very badly. So let's look at airlines. A lot of airlines went bankrupt back in 2008. Well, the industry fundamentally restructured in 2012. It went from being one of the worst industries in the S&P 500 to one of the strongest. They have pricing power. They have far less competition. They have very reasonable valuations. They have lots of cash flow that they put into uh, share buybacks that are not funded with issuing debt. They're paying down debt and buying back shares at the same time. But at the same time, we get forward valuations of seven and eight PEs because of this lingering fear. Uh, so you have names like that. We have names in the housing sector, these things that are in long-term cyclical upturns because of you know, the downturn that they're still recovering from in the case of housing. Uh, so there's a number of things that are in industrials, that are in uh, uh, consumer discretionary, um, that we find deep valuation in, even in today's market. Uh, beyond that, we find stuff in Europe as its economy get, begins to come out of a very, very deep uh, recession. Um, there are names there where we get very, very good valuations. So there are names out there, but they're small pockets in what we view as a, as a big overpriced market. Thus, the need for the active manager that is working very hard to find those small pockets to find you sort of safety in valuation. Find those names that are strong that have good valuations, and that, uh, that can give you good sustained earnings growth or that can use their cash uh, for share buybacks uh, in that sort of way. So we, we do have a number of names out there. We're already fine. We are able to get uh, our portfolio set up. So we have a forward PE of 15 versus the market's 19, or our peg ratio is a 1.4 versus the market's you know, 2.2, 2.4. So we find the names, but you have to do a lot of strong digging, and you have to make sure at the same time your companies are fundamentally strong, and every single one of them could even survive a 2008, 2009 sort of recession because the natures of their businesses are strong enough to do that. Dan, maybe same question for you. Uh, what are the sectors you guys like on the long side and, and conversely on the short side? Well, most of our book is in tech, healthcare, and consumer, both long and short. And we, we're, we're obviously um, on board with the tech renaissance that's going on. And we think that tech is breaking out of tech. And, and we're not talking about FANG, we're talking about multiple product cycles going on in tech, which are leading to a lot of great opportunities on the long side. But then those same technological changes are leading to tons of shorts as well. When you look at what's happening in the consumer space, and there was a consumer panel earlier today, 
You couldn't have an Amazon without the technology that there is right now from a logistics perspective, from a big data, from an artificial intelligence, from them changing prices and knowing what you want and getting things to you in, in a day with Amazon Prime. That's technology doing that. And there are companies that are using technology to make their experiences better. So the panel also talked about the strength of experiences, concerts, restaurants, cruise lines. All of those experiences are more valuable now because social media made them so. If I was sitting here 10 years ago and I said to any of you, what's the likelihood you're gonna take a picture of your food tonight and text it to somebody, you would have thought I was insane, right? But what's happening is social media is valuing those experiences. When you put it online and 20 people see that you ate at a fancy restaurant, we're all vain and we all have an ego, that makes us feel a certain way. Nobody takes a picture of a piece of furniture they just bought and puts it on Facebook and says, hey, look at my sideboard, isn't it gorgeous? So what's happening is you're seeing apparel, furniture, all those sorts of areas get decimated because the consumer's fine, they're just shifting their spending and technology's allowing it. Same thing in healthcare and same thing in so many different sectors. So you have to step back and say, who's got the wind at their back secularly because of tech and who's got the wind at their face? And, and we go long and short both companies. So if we wake up one day and the consumer data is negative, you know, on a GDP basis or the consumer spending's down, we don't care. What we care about is that we have the right horses on both sides. Yeah, I, if I can follow up on that, I, we totally agree with the uh, experiential uh, theme. Uh, thus, you know, us being in travel, you know, avoiding retail. We have some healthcare names, the same reasons, a bigger, grow, bigger, faster growing part of the uh, GDP. Uh, also, the technology helping uh, one of our big names is Expedia, right? So there's a technology helping people uh, in the whole uh, travel experience. They shop for travel on Expedia and then you know then they take our airlines to go fly in and and have the experiences uh, so we're in the in the same theme and same mindset uh, that there are certain parts of the economic uh, of the economy that are growing faster because of uh, what's happening in, in consumer trends well good I think that's a, a great place to leave it a point of content or consensus um, thanks to everyone for listening I had a great time chatting with you guys I hope everyone in the audience had a good time as well. Um, great investors here. So uh, we'll be around after the panel if anyone wants to talk one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.